From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. We have another week of busyness going on. The Ragnarok ransomware releases a master decryptor after shutting down. Verizon has successfully deployed a VPN that could withstand quantum attacks. And does cyber insurance make ransomware worse? Well, these are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you every day this week on the Cybersecurity Headlines podcast. And now we get a chance for some insight, some expertise, some opinion on these stories and more from our guest, who this week is uh, Eddie Contreras, who is CISO at Frost Bank. So, Eddie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Steve. Well, it's a great pleasure to see you. Uh, we've got a lot here to talk about this week, as usual, but I also want to mention before we start that our sponsor for today is Privacy.com. They have a really cool product that I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit later on. And please feel free to join us on Crowdcast. We've got the address up here so you can share your comments and thoughts as we go through our show, because that's why we're here. We'd love to hear what you have to say as well. But, you know, we just got 10 minutes right now to talk about some of the stories that have been really capturing people's ideas and, and thoughts this week. And the first one is the big players. We had this big, huge uh, Wednesday White House cybersecurity meeting uh, summit, and everybody, everybody brought something to the table this week. Apple is going to push for mass adoption of multi-factor authentication and vulnerability remediation. Google is committing to investing $10 billion to um, in expand its zero trust programs. Microsoft is going to do it with $20 billion, uh, including security protections. And Amazon is looking to make some of their internal security awareness training and MFA devices uh, free to AWS customers. And even cyber insurers are looking to get in here, improving or pledging to improve the security posture of policyholders. So, Eddie, my question to you in terms of all this stuff, it's a lot of goodwill here, a lot of the, the groaning board of a great table full of uh, good stuff. Do you think this is sustainable? Is it a uh, tipping point for greater community focus on cybersecurity or just a, a good uh, photo op for everybody? You know, uh, I, I you always want to assume uh, that uh, everybody's here to do good. And, and of course, companies are here to make money. Uh, but we've all worked with Microsoft and Google for a long time. Nothing really comes for free. Uh, and, and anybody who's purchased an E5 license knows if you want that full functionality, you got to pay a little bit more. So uh, I'm optimistic. I want to make sure that they come in and say, listen, we're here to do good. Uh, but I also know there's a long tail in this and, and that the commitment is not just uh, for the betterment of the communities, but it's also for the betterment uh, of, of the people that are interacting with those communities. Uh, so I'm optimistic. Uh, I'm hoping it, stay, it sustains uh, and, and we'll see where it goes. Yeah, I think you're totally right. This, they're in business for business, but uh, we hear so many stories about uh, small organizations or let's say uh, water plants that are uh, using very old technologies they can't afford to upgrade. So I, I'm always curious to know whether this will shift public perception as well and public comfort as, uh, as they see the big players recognize these challenges as to what they are. But seeing this, we can also move along to a similar kind of story, which uh, is talking about sort of the flaws in um, ICS and industrial control systems. So in the first half of 2021, so this year, uh, more than 600 ICS floors were spotted. And this is um, uh, belonging to a number of uh, well-known companies like Siemens and Schneider Electric and a few others as well, of course. Uh, and a lot of these vulnerabilities were uh, rated as severe, um, critical, uh, dangerous to industrial control systems. And 90% of them were discovered to be exploitable without the need for any specialized kind of knowledge. Now, to me, that's a little bit concerning because, once again, uh, we all know about uh, these large uh, industrial organizations and their applications being so vulnerable. Uh, to see that there's also very little knowledge required to exploit them uh, doesn't sound like great a very, very sort of encouraging. So what is your take on this? Is this just, again, the norm or should people be doing more on the industrial side? You know, I think this has always been there, right? This is not something that's uh, net new. Uh, the way I see this is it does force, uh, you know, a, a lot of the security groups to reevaluate how they look at infrastructure. Uh, and everybody's always concerned about web everybody's concerned about operating systems and you always hear about people bucketing infrastructure. Well, we'll get to that just because it's a hands-on task. Uh, but because we have so many devices in our data centers, because we get black boxes from our vendors, uh, it forces you to reevaluate that, that, that logic and really understand, listen, I have to bring them into my TLM program. I have to be able to have oversight of this process. It's no longer a small risk just because 
the the course to remediate it's such he- it's a, such a heavy handed effort uh, i think it does uh, force people to reevaluate their programs it's uh again there's a lot of money involved and a lot of legacy uh, technology that has to be sort of uh, sold or fixed or patched over uh so we've got uh, in terms of legacy stories another one that, that just uh, is is making the sort of the eyebrow raising headlines right now i think is that apple uh, started scanning for uh, sexual assault, sexual abuse materials. Now, this is something that uh, you know sounds like a very good and, and necessary thing uh, to begin with, but it's said that it would start um, cl- um, client-side scanning of devices for hashes derived from this kind of material, which they call CSAM. Um, when it, it would only occur when it's uploading content to the cloud, which had some privacy implications and concerns. But now Apple is confirming that it has been scanning outgoing and incoming iCloud mail for this since 2019, although it says it has not been scanning uh, iCloud photographs or backups. So obviously there's some definite uh, sort of proactive mindset behind this, but privacy uh, advocates are saying, well, this is kind of thing we should know a little bit more about. And sources tell 9to5Mac that uh, the the total number of reports and and concerns are only being measured in the hundreds right now. But... Is this proactive protection or is this uh, taking too many liberties with people's uh, communication? You know, I, I think the category offers, uh, you know, uh, uh, the ability to bring attention to this. If you remove the category, which I'm completely in favor of, you you know, that's something you just don't want to do is exploit children. Uh, but if you remove the category, it's a privacy discussion. Uh, and the assumption is people don't read their privacy policies. You know, uh, there is a lot of user uh, end user agreements that people agree to. They scroll as quick as possible to get to the bottom of it. Uh, but if you take your time and read it and, and understand where your data is at, now with CCPA, with GDPR, uh, with so many states applying their own uh, governing bodies to this to say, listen, privacy is actually something we care about. There is now an opportunity for users to actually engage and disassociate yourself from those types of concerns uh, while, you know, the category itself completely understand and, and it's warranted. You remove the category and should a company be looking at your data? Uh, the assumption is if you're on somebody's platform, they have that ability. Uh, you should never assume your data is going into a database and the IT admin can't look at it. Of course they can look at it. Somebody has to see it and manage it and validate it. So I, I applaud the fact that they're they're tackling this category, uh, but I also think people just need to understand, read those policies, understand what's in those policies. Don't just click through it, especially if you're sharing data. It, it, it is accessible. Yeah, but have you read those policies? I mean, looked at them. I mean, they are impossible to read. And I read, I learned somewhere that uh, half of it is written in all caps just to make it really hard to read. Not not to dissuade you from reading it, but to make sure you really focus on every single word. That's why it's so uncomfortable to read. But boy, I mean, they are. And they have links in there now. <laughs> they have links and they get, they take you to a web page. Oh, if you want to finish reading this, go to the web page and read the rest of the content. So yeah, they, they keep you engaged. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it is there, and it's, re, it's reading the manual, as the old acronym used to be, kind of, but uh, it's a lot of stuff to take on. But yeah, it is perhaps our personal responsibility to do so. So let's look at personal responsibility here with regards to another famous story from last week, which was the big T-Mobile hack. Uh, it seems to be, or perhaps it is anyway, that a 21-year-old a Virginia native who now lives in Turkey with his mother claims to be the driving force behind this hack. Uh, that exposed the data of more than 50 million people. He told the Wall Street Journal that he, he did this from his home where he gained access to a data center near East Wenatchee, Washington, which took about a week to gain access. And he realized how big he got onto something, you know, huge here. Now, he has some particular grudges uh, uh, about uh, law enforcement and, and things that have happened in his past. But his quote was, their security is awful. Now, Assuming that this is true, does this, this doesn't say a lot for T-Mobile's security if this is a true story. So do you think it's possible that this is one of these lone wolf type uh, you know, sitting in their bedroom kind of hacking stories? Um, could this be possible for an individual to break into someone as big or something as big as T-Mobile? Yeah, I, I would be really shocked if this was a lone wolf. Uh, uh, you have to think about crowdsourcing and, and how actually people develop code today. You know, the underground and the, and the dark web, it's no different than your CICD pipeline. Most code is repurposed uh, and people have people that validate it. Check this out. Can you get some, can you provide some input? And so while I think he might have been the face of this notice, uh, you know, I'm sure he's had a, you know, a, a back group of friends that have helped him and said, hey, 
don't forget to look at this. What about this? Here, share, try this out, right? And so, you know, rarely do you have somebody just act on their own and say, let me go do this. Uh, you typically have a group of people that provide a, uh, an expertise in different areas. I know for a fact that, you know, if I was an expert in one area, one area doesn't get you to the, the keys of the kingdom. You need to go to other experts. And so, you know, my my history in this field has been surround yourself with smart people. Uh, collectively, you can do big things. And, and this kid did a big thing. And, and I, while he's the face of it, I don't think he's the only person involved in it. That's very intriguing unto itself, because um, even if he's not a lone wolf, I mean, if he is, as you said, part of a, of a pack, that's, that's another intriguing issue for us to consider as well and always keep front of mind. So I just want to pause for a second here and acknowledge our sponsor for this week. This is Privacy.com. Now, Privacy.com lets you buy things online using virtual cards instead of having to use your real ones, which protects your identity and bank information on the Internet. For example, if you're shopping online and you're ready to check out, you simply generate a privacy card that will enter in random numbers, random variables. And should the merchant ever get hacked... The fraudsters will never have access to your real information. So privacy cards are great for monitoring subscriptions, signing up for free trials where a card number is required. Uh, you simply close the cards whenever you want to ensure that you're never charged without your consent going forward. So privacy.com is offering right now if you sign up for free today at privacy.com forward slash CISO. Uh, new users will get a $5 credit to be used for any online purchase that you wish to make. So you can check that out at privacy.com. New Hampshire has been losing millions to a uh, uh, basically an email scam, business email scam. Uh, $2.3 million doesn't sound like a lot, but uh, for New Hampshire's town, this is, a, this is a lot of money. And it was um, uh, the school board, basically the school district uh, twigged on this when they didn't get their uh, monthly transfer. Uh, but basically they fell for a business um, uh, an email scam and lost a lot. So the question is here. We're seeing a town feeling perhaps they are too small to be a target. That is a very common uh, issue. I'm too small. No one's going to find us because we're just too small. What advice would you give to organizations of any size, as individuals, as companies, or as municipalities, uh, when they feel they're too small to be a target? I mean, the answer is obvious, but how would you phrase it to let them know, hey, this can happen to you? You know, th this is a great topic and, and a question I was waiting for. Um, it, it's the big stories or the big names uh, or the large dollar amounts, dollar amounts that that garner the attention. The reality is, you know, and, and I work for a bank. This happens all the time and it happens to so many people and the dollar amounts are just small. Uh, but if you think about this as, a, a, you know, as a consumer, if you think about this as somebody uh, who has a small amount of money in your account, if you lose 10,000 and all you had is 12 and you have a mortgage to make and it takes a little while to get that money back, this is quite impactful. Uh, and so for me, I look at this story as uh, 1.2 million is this one instance. This has made over 6 billion in, in the last few years here. So billion is a, is a large number and that's because it happens so frequently to so many different people. So for me, I think this is a personal story that people should understand. Understand where you bank with. Are they federally insured? Can you get your money back if you fall victim to this type of uh, crime? Uh, but the reality is it happens more often than people would like to recognize. And, and it's not about the big dollars. It, it's death by a thousand cuts. Okay, yeah, that's, that's an, an, excellent, uh, an excellent analogy. Um, yeah, so uh, it's it's a kind of literacy that people need to be aware of, I think, in terms of, of uh, going forward. Nobody is immune. Uh, so some will consider, you know, turning to insurance when they get ransomware. Uh, so there's a new story, a new study, rather, that's come out from the Talion, cybersecurity firm Talion, who's saying that 70% of cybersecurity professionals believe that cyber insurance payouts to victims exac exacerbates the issue of ransomware. And it found that 45% of respondents thought that organizations don't report ransomware attacks because they believe it'll slow down recovery. And 37% said it's because a company paid a ransom and they wanted to avoid legal trouble. And finally, 10% said they don't even know how to report a ransomware incident to law enforcement. So once again, this seems like the bad guys maybe are getting ahead of the game. What's your thought about that? You know, ransomware and insurance, uh, it brings to light that you have to understand if it was a security decision, it's an easy decision. But there is a business aspect to this as well. And when ransomware is involved, the security person is just one executive at the table. And you have marketing, you have legal, 
you have other executives, you have your CEO, you have operations. Uh, and so when it comes to decision to do we engage our insurance company, you know, uh, you know, security professionals can advise, uh, can help guide, but ultimately it's what's in the best interest of the company. And so I think, you know, I don't see in cyber insurance as making ransomware worse. Uh, it's part of that ecosystem. Uh, and you never know what decision is going to be made because there's so many stakeholders involved in that conversation. Uh, and so I think, you know, if you've ever been involved in ransomware, if you are a leader in that point, the best exercise is table topic uh, and, and do tabletop exercises. Uh, and the reality is, even if you exercise this time and time again, when it does happen, you still are going to have to make a, a, a decision that you may not have prepared for. So uh, I don't think it makes it in, uh, in complicated. I, I think it's just part of the ecosystem that you have to acknowledge. Right. Yeah. It's just it's just life as it is today. And I just want to pause and acknowledge one of our uh, uh, viewers on Crowdcast for a moment here that uh, John G from Biaco is saying, going back to our story about um, basically industrial control systems. You know, they he points out that they are outside of corporate governance and or getting exemptions, which is one reason why it's becoming an expanding attack surface. So, uh, John from Viaku, thank you very much for commenting on that. We really appreciate that. Uh, so, moving along here, a couple of last stories. I mean, hey, the, you know, the, the 20 minutes goes by so quickly. It's just amazing. But uh, this is, a, again, one of these great stories because of the, the huge ogre in the business here, Ragnarok Ransomware, um, who has been in operation since January of 2020. Uh, it appears to have called it quits, and they're replacing all the victims on their leak site with a master decryption key and instructions on how to use it. That's very nice. I hope they are readable. Uh, they left no explanation for shutting down, um, but the uh, uh, some of the experts, ransomware experts like Michael Gillespie, have tested out the decryptor and have successfully decrypted some files, so it does indeed work. So uh, finally, they're saying that the, there's, a, there's a universal decryptor in the works and will be released as well. Uh, so. These ransomware gangs seem to be doing this. They they sort of go into and out of retirement faster and more often than classic rock bands do. And I'm just wondering, you know, is this just a, a clever game of sort of whack-a-mole? You can't keep track where these people are and they keep popping up as different brands? Or are they just simply suffering business ups and downs like the rest of us? You know, I, I think it's less of the business up and downs, but I think this is actually a, a very creative business model. It's about speed of trust. It's about bidding, building credibility. If you say you're a ransomware actor and your your whole purpose of making money is to get people to trust that you're going to help decrypt it, uh, you got to give them a couple of wins. And, and this is that win. And, and so, you know, the industry understands that they bring them in and they say, listen, uh, there's a couple of people that are going to have to give up your keys uh, in order for us to make money in the long run. So, uh, you know, make you smile. It's great. They did this. Uh, it's about if you truly want to continue to pay, you, these people have to do this once in a while. And this is kind of that uh, feel good story. But in the reality, <laughs> there's more under the covers. <laughs> wow. It's kind of like, yeah, the, the first sample is free. I've heard that a lot yes. of times, a lot of situations. <laughs> How interesting. That's exactly. an excellent insight. Thank you so much. Well, you know, we just have time for one last story. And this is one that I've been looking forward to. It's because I'm fascinated by quantum uh, computing. So Verizon has successfully deployed a VPN that it says is uh, can withstand quantum attacks. Now, I'm, I'm not sure everybody is familiar with what quantum computing is, but from a cybersecurity standpoint, it, it, it threatens to really compress uh, decryption times uh, because of its, its, its nature. So uh, according to Verizon, the trial is using encryption keys were generated using post-quantum cryptography methods and demonstrates that it is possible to release current security processes with quantum-proof protocols. So. To me, this is an interesting story, whether it is, you know, really super perfectly legitimately true, which I'm not not doubting, but in terms of, of being foolproof or whether it's just demonstrating that we're on the way with this. I think it helps generate an awareness of what quantum computing is. And there is even a term called uh, Y2Q. I'm not sure if you've heard of that or is it Q2K, but it's definitely a play on the Y2K thing saying that four years from now, quantum computing is going to be a real big thing. I think it is Y2Q. So what's your take on this particular announcement? Uh, where, where does it to leave you? You know, I spoke at the uh, graduate class, the business class at uh, the Carlos Alvarez uh, UTSA last year. And part of my speech was, welcome to the industry. You are going to solve things that I have no idea how to fathom 
quantum computing is coming. Uh, it's a challenge uh, and we need smart people like you to help solve that. So I think it's an interesting topic. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, I do believe it'll be a problem uh, sooner rather than later. So, uh, and of course it'll be a benefit as well. So excited for the discussion, uh, but I think it's a little ways away, but the good thing is we have smart people in the pipelines to help solve this. Uh, it's, it's good to know that. And I mean, thinking back to all the stories in the show here, I mean, it's uh, so much of this is just a continuing ongoing avalanche of change and uh, keeping up with the bad guys, as, as we do know. So uh, thinking back again to the, sh the stories we had, was there any one of these that was particular favorites of yours? There, there was, and it's, it's a personal one just because I work for a financial institution. That BEC scam, it's out there. Uh, it takes, you know, it targets, you know, elderly. It targets people that have, you know, money that comes in on the fifth and the first and the 15th. Uh, and it's impactful. If you lose 5,000 and you only have, you know, 5,100, if you lose 20,000, if you lose your small savings, you're not going to make the CNN news. You're not going to make any grab headlines but it hurts. Uh, and so I think BEC is something that you have to talk to people about and you really have to understand how big of a problem this really is. Uh, and the reality is the only control is people. It's awareness, it's training. So, uh, you know, talk about it. It's a good topic for me. Well, that is truly excellent. And I mean, I really appreciated everything you've shared with us today. Uh, if people wanted to get in touch with you or find you, what is their best way to, to, to find you? Uh, best way to find me is I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, go ahead and uh, send me a note, a connection note. I'll connect with you. I do share uh, a lot of articles on there. Uh, we hire. And so we're hiring at, at my company. So it, those are the types of things I'm posting. And of course, I share knowledge and, and, and uh, love to learn from others. So LinkedIn's a good way to get a hold of me. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Eddie. Eddie it's been a real delight talking to you. Um, and while you're here, I'm just going to uh, you know, wrap things up by saying that uh, thank you very much to our sponsor for this week, which is privacy.com. I love their product. Um, and uh, you can find us every day, every weekday at least, in the Cybersecurity Headlines podcast, to, delivering to you the information that you need to know. There is no video chat coming up uh, next Friday because of Labor Day, but we will be back with another edition of the Week in Review next Friday as well. So it has been a pleasure working with you, Eddie. Thank you so much. And to everyone else, thank you for being here as well. We will see you again soon. Stay safe and take care. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.